Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. So today I'm going to be discussing my personal top 10 picks of the year, books that I've read this year that I've really, really adored and want to share with you guys. I want to share these recommendations. Some of these books did come out this year, some of these books came out a while ago, so they're not necessarily my top 10 releases of the year, but they are my favourite books that I personally read this year and I'm really excited to talk to you guys about them because I love every single one of these books. They've all got a special place in my heart from now on. 2022 has been my biggest and best year of reading yet. So far, there's still a few days left in the year. I've read 62 books, over 17,000 pages. And according to Goodreads so far, my average rating for the books that I've read this year are 4.1 stars, which means that I've read some spectacular books. I've picked some spectacular books to read this year. And it was really actually hard to narrow down my top 10. I kind of just judged based on enjoyment and also impact, uh, whether I still think about them to this day and I think I've created as accurately as possible the top 10 like best books of the year but before I get into my top 10 I just wanted to give a quick shout out to some honourable mentions that I was considering to put on this list those are The Girl From The Other Side manga series by Nagabe, Watering The Soul by Courtney Pepinel, Spells For Forgetting by Adrian Young, The Little Prince by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, Lonely Castle In The Mirror by Mizuki Sujimura, Other People's Clothes by Carla Henkel, the Woman in Black by Susan Hill, The Seventh Bride by T. Heng Fisher, Yinka Where's Your Husband by Lizzie Damalola Blackburn, and two books that I am still in the middle of reading so couldn't put on this list, The Poppy War by R.F. Kuang and Letters to a Young Poet by Raina Maria Rilke. So starting with some books that brought some pure joy into my life this year. I read this trilogy over three months in the summer and absolutely adored it. I would have read it faster if I wasn't trying to savour it so much. And that is the Cruel Prince trilogy by Holly Black. And since this is a top 10 books list, I would say that I enjoyed the Cruel Prince the most out of the three. So this is at number 10. In this book, our main character Jude and her two sisters are brought up in the world of fairy, a world that hates humans and ergo hates Jude. She just wants to belong though and she kind of gets tangled into fairy court politics and espionage which takes us as the reader on a really really fun journey and this is essentially just a quintessential YA fantasy with a sprinkling of slow burn hate to love romance which I just ate up. I think it's so fun. It doesn't take itself too seriously. It kind of starts off as a bully romance as well, which is probably the only bully romance that I've actually really enjoyed all the way through. I don't know if this is classified as an urban fantasy just because there are quite a few scenes in the human world, in our world, which kind of threw me off at first. But once I got into it and kind of got used to that, I actually really enjoyed the world that Holly Black has created in the series. And I am so looking forward to reading The Stolen Air in January. I've pre-ordered it because I'm so excited to get back into this world. And you better believe that I'm going to be rereading this series at some point in the future, maybe even in 2023, because it just went so fast. Like my only, I guess, criticism of this series, I feel like this one is actually the longest book. All of the books are super short, which is kind of refreshing in a way, um, but also at some points, especially in the second and third book in the trilogy, I kind of just wanted a little bit more. And that's why I love The Cruel Prince so much, the first book, because I feel like it was the perfect length. It set up this story very, very strongly. It had such a gripping ending. I mean, that's pretty much why I ordered the next two as soon as I'd finished this and read them in quick succession. But yeah, I feel like I've still yet to get so much enjoyment out of these books. I'm going to try and read everything that Holly Black comes out with as well, because there was just something about this series that was just so enjoyable for me and kind of brought me back to my roots of YA fantasy. One of the more impactful books on this list is Hex by Jenny Fagan coming in at number nine. I read this one, it's very short. I read this all in one sitting on a Patreon reading sprint. I don't know, if you know me, you know that it takes quite a lot for me to cry at books. I kind of cry at the drop of a hat in my personal life and at movies, but with books, it's so hard to make me cry. And this one, I ended up tearing up multiple times during that live stream. It is so brutal, this book. It is so, so sad. And spoiler alert, the top book on this list actually made me sob and sob. I don't know what it is. I feel like I've been picking really hard-hitting books this year, but Hex is the story of Gaylis Duncan, who was a girl who grew up in 16th century Scotland during the witch trials here in the UK. The real life Gaelis was accused of being a witch and sentenced to death back then. And Jenny Fagan tells Gaelis's story in the most inventive and mesmerizing way. So a girl from our modern world travels back in time to talk with Gaelis 
in her prison cell the night before her execution and kind of find out a little bit about her life and what led her to this point and we kind of find out bit by bit what happened to this girl and just it is so harrowing especially because this is based on a true story usually i don't love consuming super sad media but with this book, it just had all of the ingredients that I love in a novel. It had beautiful poetic writing, magical realism, which pops up a lot on this list. It uses historical events to actually highlight things that are happening in our world right now, like current issues, which I thought was done so well. It was kind of subtle, but it was definitely like a nod to what happens to women in the current day. And it was the perfect length for a story like this. It is super duper short. It's actually only a hundred pages and it just tells the story so effectively. You don't need any more pages to a book like this when you do it right. And I'm finding the more I read, the more I kind of figure out what I like in terms of pacing and length of the novel and what works and what doesn't. And this did all of that perfectly. I don't think this will come as a shock to anybody, but the next book on this list is I'm Glad My Mum Died by Jeanette McCurdy, which is the only book on this list that I actually listened to on Audible. And it's also the only nonfiction book on this list as well. So I started this read on a whim one day because I wanted a new audiobook to take with me on a trip to the shop. And this one had literally just come out that week. But like a lot of people, I was kind of fascinated by the idea of this story about a child star who I am very, very aware of. I watched iCard from a young age and I definitely thought I wanted the life that Jeanette had. I wanted to be a child star, I wanted to get into acting, like I was just obsessed with Disney Channel and Nickelodeon at that point in my life. But yeah, I wasn't really expecting too much because I hadn't heard that many reviews at this point considering it had only been out for a few days. But you guys, this memoir is so incredibly written. Listening to the audiobook, I genuinely felt like I was just having a conversation with Jeanette about her childhood and her traumas. And I was absolutely taken with her words and her thoughts. Some of the topics in this book were very, very hard hitting, but Jeanette's writing voice was the perfect tone for dealing with these topics. She was blunt, but her writing style was always so humorous and had so much character. I would genuinely read whatever she writes next just because it is so easy to listen to, so easy to read. It has this kind of quality to it that keeps you reading every single time you finish a chapter you want to go on to the next one so although you guys have probably heard a lot about this book it is definitely my favorite memoir I've read so far in my life so I just had to include it on this list. Next up is The Pisces by Melissa Broder who is definitely a new favorite author after just one book. This book is about Lucy who is going through a life crisis. She's just had a breakup with her long-term partner and her career is kind of on the ropes. She doesn't really know which direction she's going in. As a main character, she and us as readers are very aware of her aging and her fertility and I guess how she views her fertility at least. So luckily her sister who lives in California offers to let Lucy house sit and dog sit for her and her partner while they're away in Europe just to kind of reinvigorate Lucy and get her life back on track just give her a little breather and a break and so Lucy goes to get out of this funk and it kind of gets her into a lot of interesting situations that we witnessed throughout this book like dating on tinder going to group therapy with a bunch of women that she kind of deems to be beneath her ends up meeting a mysterious man on the beach next to her sister's house and she finds out that this guy is actually a merman and they have this massive romance and it's just very, very weird and complicated. Similarly to in Hex, this magical realism element of this book is something that I absolutely adore and eat up every single time. I was just so intrigued and reading this so quickly because I wanted to find out where this was gonna go. It's probably the weirdest relationship I read about in a book between a human and a mer person. Like how is that ever going to work out? So I kind of wanted to know what Melissa Broder was going to do with this. And it is the sort of plot where things go wrong again and again for the main character and you're kind of just witnessing this train wreck of a person but in a way it's also super relatable despite this book being completely off of the wall there is always something to relate to in someone like Lucy's life. Other than that I can't really explain why I enjoyed this so much like it is disgusting and disturbing. I don't know how I enjoyed this this much but I can't wait to read more of Melissa Broder's writing. I just feel like she's my kind of author. She writes in a way that I just really really click with. When I read it it definitely inspired me to start writing again which is really cool and that is why it had a big impact on me and that is why it's on this list. 
Something very different from our last book is Gallant by V.E. Schwab. This is my second V.E. Schwab book and my favourite by far. And unlike quite a lot of people that had some negative opinions on this one, I actually gave it five stars. I wasn't expecting anything going in and it absolutely blew me away and I loved it and it's exactly the kind of story that I love. It's a gothic tale set in the past sometime. It feels like it's in a like alternate universe, like our world but with magic. There are ghost-like beings, there is a haunted mansion where things aren't quite as they seem. So there's an element of mystery there, there's also found family trope, there's so much to love about this story and it's also really beautifully told like this is some of the e shops in my opinions her best writing that i've read anyway and to top it all off this so reminds me of Coraline, which is one of my favorite movies and what i tell people when they're going into reading this book so olivia our main character is a girl who has never spoken in her life she has grown up in this kind of orphanage type place and then she receives a letter from an uncle who she didn't know about asking her to come to gallant however when she turns up nobody's expecting her and her uncle is long since passed so olivia has to try and figure out why she's been called there who's called her there and she also finds out the truth behind her unconventional heritage back in the spring when i read this and told everybody that i loved it everyone said that i should watch crimson peak which this gets compared to all the time so i feel like it works both ways if you like the movie crimson peak i feel like you should also read this book it is for a slightly younger audience it's a lot less horrific and a lot less raunchy but at its core it is a very very similar haunting story and i absolutely love it and i will continue to read books like this if i can to start off my top five is a fictional short story collection and that is my pen is the wing of a bird new fiction by afghan women these stories are mostly based on the writer's own experiences growing up and living in a beautiful yet volatile country of all the books on this list this is definitely the most impactful of all and also the one that i would recommend to everyone i feel like every single person who picks up this book can get something out of it whether it's to educate yourself on what's going on in Afghanistan, understanding and appreciating our own privilege and luck based on where we were born, or just simply reading some beautifully written and translated stories about very poignant human situations. I feel like getting educated on what's going on in Afghanistan currently is more important than ever. On the day that I'm filming this video, we recently found out that women in Afghanistan are no longer permitted to study at universities, which is just heartbreaking and i'm gonna try and include some useful links to some information on what's going on in afghanistan right now the current situation and potentially ways that you guys can help but honestly one way that you can start to help is to buy books like this not only to open our eyes to what goes on in places like these but also to monetarily support the writers, the authors, the translators who are all from and I believe mostly live in Afghanistan and also to support groups like Untold who make it possible for those writers to get their voices out there, get their stories out there. And I really hope that at least one person watching ends up picking up this book. Another translated work on this list is She and Her Cat by the creator of Your Name, a really popular animated film, Makoto Shinkai. I read this one recently and absolutely fell in love with it. It is another book that I pretty much read in one sitting. It is quite short and it comprises of four shorter stories about some cats and their owners in a Tokyo suburb. So the setting is super charming. Everything about this is charming. I think that's how I would describe it. What's really fun and unique about this book as well is that it is told um, and narrated from both the points of view of the humans and also the cats as well. And I feel like the writer and the translator really captured the personality of a cat in these stories. Like I personally feel like if a cat were to speak or write down their thoughts, these are the sort of things that they would be saying and the way that they would view our world. Um, which is just so genius, like it's so clever. And I feel like that made this reading experience so joyful for me. I feel like everybody who reads this can get joy out of it, especially if you're an animal lover, but also even if you're not like the biggest cat person, like I'm personally more of a dog person and I still absolutely love this. We have one specific dog character who adds so much to the story. I grew up in my teenage years with both cats and dogs and i feel like i need to give my cats more credit like they are so intelligent just beautiful creatures and also this book is so much more deep than it appears to be on the surface like obviously it is a lovely cute tale but it also delves into the more serious topics like loneliness and depression and a person's life purpose it's so inspiring and thought-provoking which i love 
Okay, so we're finally at the top three. Can you guess what these are? Like, I feel like it is definitely guessable from the videos that I've put up on my channel. Like, if you've been watching me all year, you might be able to guess some of the top three, if not the top spot. Coming in at number three is Circe by Madeline Miller. The biggest shock to me about this book is that I actually enjoyed it a heck of a lot more than I enjoyed The Song of Achilles, which I also gave five stars. I said when I was reading this that if I could give it six stars, I would. That's how much I loved it when I read it. I also remember saying when I put this book down that I feel like Circe was written for me. And for that reason, it became an immediate all-time favorite. Despite reading this over a few months in three different countries, I bought this copy in Berlin and started reading it there. Then I decided that I wanted to wait to read it in Greece in September and then I finished it when I got home. So yeah, although I read it over such a long period of time, it genuinely felt like a one sitting kind of read. And although it is also a very, very slow paced book, which aren't always my favorites, I was captivated the whole time with the highs and the lows of the plot for two main reasons. Firstly, Madeline Miller is just a genius storyteller. She breathes new life into old tales and each one of those tales in this book had me gripped as much as the last one. My best friend actually described this book as being a sequence of short stories throughout Cersei's life, which I think is the perfect way to describe it. And you're kind of either gonna love it or hate it for that exact reason. Some people find that it's a little bit choppy and it doesn't feel like one story that they can really get into, but I just loved it for that reason. The way Madeline Miller wrote this created it's this feel that is so sweeping that we've spent all of this time with Cersei and really, really got to know her. And that is the other thing I love about this book. Cersei herself is such an incredibly strong main character. She has an incredibly interesting origin story, first of all, and then we get to follow her as she kind of grows into who she is and discovers what she wants out of her life and takes control over her own life, which is just so interesting and like magical to witness. I feel like I could take life lessons from reading this book. Yeah, she's basically everything I want in a main character of a book. I feel like the common thread that goes through my top three picks specifically is how well written the characters are. And I feel like that is something that I'm discovering is super important to my own reading. I wrote here when I was talking about the book, I think that's why I prefer it over The Song of Achilles as although the characters in that are also fleshed out and complex and interesting, they don't feel on the same league in my personal opinion as the one woman force in this book. And that is exactly how I feel. Cersei is a force. Coming in at number two is a book that I could literally reread tomorrow. I'm so obsessed with it and that is All's Well by Mona Awad. I feel like this is such a gem of a book and the more I read, the more beauty I found in it. And my experience reading this was truly precious as well as exciting. So we follow Miranda who is a drama teacher who also lives with chronic pain. And in this book, she's dealing with her unruly drama students, her recent heartbreak as well, so her inner turmoil and also her past traumas. This is also another book on this list that made me cry because it succeeded so well at making me feel for a character who was essentially morally grey and kind of unlikable at certain points. This book made me feel so deeply for Miranda's physical and emotional pain and this demonstrated really well how those two things are often very intertwined. Some of the things that I enjoyed most about this book are things that are really easy for authors to get wrong and they're also so integral and important to the book and that is the setting and the characters. Not to compare but I actually think I preferred the setting in this one to Bunny. I feel like it felt so real, so tangible, because it was so alive to me. The town, the campus, the theatre, the pub where Miranda spends a lot of her time, and the characters themselves have a quality which I can't really fully explain how I feel about them. They are all just super dramatic, kind of larger than life characters, which I think fits so perfectly with the theatre setting of this book. These characters, I found like I simultaneously love to hate them, but also kind of want to emulate in my own life, which is just so odd for like a book to like elicit those emotions out of me. And like I said, I'm definitely going to be rereading this one again soon, hopefully in 2023. Um, and I'm also so excited for Mona Awards next book, which hopefully will be coming out in the autumn. So much to enjoy about this one. And I feel like I'll enjoy it more with my reread as well. 
Okay, so I'd actually be kind of surprised if none of you narrowed down my top spot to this book. I didn't actually include my reading experience of it in a vlog because I vlogged it for Patreon because it was one of my Patreon buddy reads. But even though I didn't really talk about it too much, I feel like I've made it known now that this is like my new favorite book of all time. That book is The Secret History by Donna Tartt. This book changed the game of my reading this year. And it's also the book that I mentioned that made me absolutely sob at the end of it. Like I was getting over a breakup. Like I was sobbing. So if you didn't already know, this book follows Richard, who is a transfer student. He's transferring to a New England university. And once he gets there, he decides he wants to study classics with this very tight knit cohort of students and their very intimidating yet interesting professor, Julian. Richard finds himself first as an outsider looking in throughout a lot of this book. And then slowly he gets thrown into this toxic turn of events, which faces Richard with the reality of death and his own mortality with this group of people that he is now bonded with forever, whether he likes it or not. I think the way that Donna Tart discusses death and loss in this book in a way that I've never actually read before made me really appreciate the story and her writing. I've also never read a set of characters that feel more real to me, like they could exist in some time, some place in the past. Despite how similarly dramatic they are to the characters in All's Well, I think both of those books do that very, very well. There's something about these characters that are just more fleshed out and more real feeling, more multifaceted, and we really get to know them as well. I think maybe potentially because of the length of this book. Donna Tartt did a little bit more in that way. But yeah, as characters, they feel so complete that they feel almost real. Like it's kind of like magic. Like Donna Tartt literally morphed and like created these actual human beings, like breathing human beings. And when I pick up this book, I genuinely feel transported to this world in which humans can actually be this like too good to be true yet devious, toxic, incestuous feeling and morally gray. Yeah, so simply I couldn't imagine putting another book that I've read so far in my entire life above this book at this point. It's made me approach other books in a different way. And I think it's set the bar a bit higher than I had it before for my reading. Basically, I never thought I'd be able to understand and appreciate a book like this. I kind of assumed that I wouldn't get it, that I wouldn't be smart enough to actually enjoy it, which is so funny thinking that now. Like, I feel like this book is kind of intimidating. But once I got into it, I. I found that I just clicked with it. I was surprised by how much I connected with it and how much it ended up impacting me and meaning to me as well. I feel like reading this gave me a new understanding of the impact of literature on my life and why I truly love reading. So yeah, there can't be another book on this top spot other than The Secret History. What a book. Okay, so those are my top books of the year and the books that I would genuinely recommend to anyone who thinks they have similar reading taste to me. This has definitely been a defining year of reading for me and I'm just so excited to continue that into 2023. If you want to learn about my reading plans for the next year, definitely keep a lookout for my next video. It will be one of my next videos anyway. But yeah, thank you guys so much for making it to the end of this video. I would love to know in the comments some of your favourite books of the year as well so I can add them to my list. For now, I hope you're having a great day and I will see you in my next video. Bye!